We will talk about gradients this time around, but I also I wanted to come back and talk about uh, field strength variations with distance. Uh, the last time we talked about the monopole field, we showed that if we were working with the monopole potential, we would come up with the an intensity, a monopole intensity that would vary as uh, the inverse of the square of the distance to the pole. And we also showed, uh, actually for both the um, horizontal component and the, and the, uh, vertic the vertical or horizontal or the vertical components that those field components vary as uh, inversely as, as R cubed. So let's see what this means in terms of detectability. Uh, if we have, if we're looking at the end of a very long dipole, this could be like a buried well casing uh, or a shaft a metal shaft of some sort, that field would kind of fall off as 1 over r squared. <clears throat> so if we increase r by a factor of 4, we will reduce, in the case thinking in terms of the acceleration due to gravity, we will reduce g by a factor of 16. So in this case, we have an anomaly which is 0.0224 milligauss, a very, very small anomaly. Uh, maybe not too realistic, it will be reduced to uh, 0 0.014 milligauss. Now the magnetic field of a dipole is much more complicated. As we mentioned, it has um, uh, the Earth's field has horizontal and vertical components as well as total components. And any anomaly that we look at also has vertical, horizontal, and total components. And these components vary as 1 over r cubed. So at large distances, that fourfold increase in depth, which for the monopole decreased the field intensity by a factor of 16, that would decrease the intensity of the dipole by a factor approaching 1 64th. <clears throat> so very significant. Uh, decrease in the intensity. So one of our cube fields are going to fall out of view if you're surveying, if you're looking for buried drums or underground storage tanks or unexploded ordnance. Those, the magnetic um, field of those objects is going to diminish much more rapidly with depth. So that's a point that should be emphasized, uh, that we do have these two fields, one varies as 1 over r squared, the other is 1 over r cubed. If you're looking at relatively concentrated uh, <clears throat> magnetic objects uh, that, that can be modeled by a dipole field uh, or a spherical field, uh, the drop-off is going to be quite significant over short distances. So again, this is just, just to kind of emphasize, uh, if we double the distance, um, then we go to one eighth, and this is just an example of doubling the um, distance from the center of the dipole. Here we have about a nine nanotesla anomaly. Over here we have uh, 1.2 nanoteslas. Thinking of the sensitivity of the magnetometer and all the other things that we talked about, um, the influence of elevation, which we usually don't take into consideration, the the diurnal fluctuations, the solar wind, the fluctuations associated with the solar wind and electric currents and the magnetic fields generated by those currents in the Earth's ionosphere. We're down to a point here where we aren't going to, we won't know that it's there. Over here, we can see it, nine nanoteslas. It's a good sized anomaly. Okay, gradients. Well, we talked about gradients when we looked at the Earth's gravitational field. We took the gradient of the acceleration due to gravity with respect to r in order to develop an expression which shows how the acceleration due to gravity increases with increasing distance from the center of the Earth with r. <clears throat> we found that dg dr was equal to 3.08 times 10 to the minus 6th per second squared. We multiply that by a given dr, let's say one meter. This dg turned out to be 0 0.3086 uh, uh, 
0.3086 milligauss. So <clears throat> when we convert this to milligauss. Now with the magnetic field, uh, we can take gradients, we can take the calculate the gradients both in the vertical and the horizontal direction. So we would be taking the horizontal gradient would be dh sub e ds. And then we would use the form of this operator, which would be dh sub e over r d theta. And for the vertical component, uh, would be identical to what we did uh, with the gravitational field. We'd just be d differentiating the uh, vertical component with respect to r. And that would give us the gradient. So the horizontal gradient of the horizontal field, just to take an example, we would take the derivative of h sub e with respect to r d theta or 1 over r times uh, dh sub e d theta. And the horizontal component of the Earth's magnetic field would be m times the sine of theta over r cubed. And we're taking this derivative, though, in this case, with respect to theta. So that gives us a cosine of theta. So that gives us a horizontal gradient equal to m times the cosine of theta over r to the fourth. So the gradient is dropping off uh, w with uh, r raised to the fourth power. Similarly, for the vertical component, uh, dz sub e dr, uh, this becomes negative. So as theta increases, you know we're getting closer to the equator. We know that the vertical component gets smaller. Um, over here, it gets larger as we're getting as theta gets larger, uh, and this is is dropping off as minus six times the dipole moment times the cosine of theta over r to the fourth power. Both of these gradients drop off with r to the fourth. And so a problem for you to consider would be what is the horizontal gradient of the vertical field intensity? In other words, how does it vary with uh, latitude or co-latitude at your location? And I think you know that we can uh, go to this um, NOAA site in order to get the, in order to calculate the components of the magnetic field at any location. And so you'd be evaluating this derivative, the derivative of the vertical component with respect to surface displacement. It would be dv sub e over r d theta. It would be 1 over r dd theta times uh, dd theta of 2m cosine of theta over r cubed. That gives us minus 2m sine of theta over r to the fourth. So if we have that r, <clears throat> the radius is equal to 6.378 times 10 to the 8 centimeters. And another thing that we can note, if we had to solve this problem, what is the uh, horizontal gradient or the vertical component, we could do this without knowing what the dipole moment was uh, and sine of theta simply by knowing what the horizontal component is because m times the sine of theta over r cubed is equal to the horizontal component of the Earth's magnetic field. So this reduces to minus 2 times the horizontal component of the Earth's magnetic field, in this case, divided by r. So we should be able to calculate the tangential component or the surface variations in v sub e, variations in the co-latitude or latitude direction just by knowing what h sub e is and r. And we're given r in this, in this particular case. So for your location, you might pick a location. I've picked a location here at 55.9533 degrees north, 3.1883 degrees west at sea level. And we can see what the horizontal field intensity is here. It's 17,241.7 nanoteslas. <clears throat> so we have 1 over r dv sub e d theta. That, as we showed, is equal to minus 2 h sub e over r. So we're really just, you know, plugging in the numbers at this point. And we find that per meter, it's minus 0 0.0054 nanoteslas per meter. So you really aren't going to have to worry about it uh, on a small scale survey. But uh, if your survey extends over a kilometer, we've got a gradient here, a surface gradient, a change in the vertical component of the Earth's magnetic field of 5.42 nanoteslas per kilometer. So that would be something that, you know, you would definitely happen. 
you know, you might want to uh, calculate a residual, remove the uh, regional uh, gradient. So the next time we're going to look at the anomalous field uh, intensities, uh, this is probably a good point to kind of break this down. We've talked about the uh, different components of the main field, the horizontal, the vertical, the total field. We also looked at uh, X and Y components and uh, so on. But we'll focus on these three components, E sub A, H sub A, F sub A, T. And I um, hope you'll join us next time. Uh, see you then.